Hello, everybody. We should be able to hear me. Um, we'll get started now. Um, kia ora and welcome to our seminar, our, our webinar, I should say. Um, obviously being run by the New Zealand Council for Civil Liberties. Uh, the agenda is going to be, I'm going to do a little introduction, and then we're going to go on to the, um, uh, the presentation from Anna and finished up with some questions um, for that. We're going to put, ask you to put que any questions you've got, put it in the uh, Q&A. There's a Q&A feature for Zoom, so if you, if you could use that, and I'll be passing the questions on. Um, and you can also there's also the chat function as well, as you can see, and you're welcome to use that as well. Okay, this webinar is probably is one of the outcomes from our essay prize. We wanted to encourage law students to think about civil liberties and have signed a five-year sponsorship with Vic Law to provide an annual prize for the best student essay addressing civil liberties. When we received the entries for the first year, we thought that one essay stood out and that, uh, and we we're very pleased to grant the prize to Anna Smart for her essay about physical privacy in prison. A little bit about um, Anna, she's a, a fifth-year student at Te Haringa Waka at Victoria University of Wellington undertaking law and arts um, degrees. Alongside her study, she is a law clerking for Mason's Lane Chambers on a part-time basis. Throughout her study so far, criminal law and constitutional law have been themes of particular interest. And after graduating, she tends to study a year of full immersion to Reo Māori alongside profs, finding a graduate role in the legal profession. Uh, I'm now gonna hand over to Anna to talk to us about her work. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Thomas. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I'm just going to share my screen to begin, and then we'll be away. Um, can you all see my slides? Yes. Great. All right. Well, tēnā koutou katoa. No mai ki tēnei webinar i te pōnei. Um, so it's ahi, ka noi te mihi ki a New Zealand Council for Civil Liberties. Um, yeah, ko waio. Uh, no ingirangi koti rana me parani o kutipuna. Ingari itipa kia ho i raro ite maru o nga pai maunga o rimutaka kite taha o te awa kairangi. No reira um, ko te tiriti o waitangi te kawanata, tōku kawanata. Uh, no tam ki makoro in nohuana inaine. I uh, ko ena tōku ingoa. Thank you all for joining tonight's seminar. It's a real privilege to be here sharing with you tonight, um, especially after working on this paper solo for so long. It's wonderful that it's found a place in the community and to kind of be discussed and engaged with. So I feel really grateful for that. Um, I begin with my peer pepeha for two reasons. Um, firstly, it's a means of introducing myself. And secondly, it's a means of acknowledging my positionality in this story. So tonight we're talking about privacy and prism. And Māori are significantly overrepresented in our prison population. Um, so 52% actually of people incarcerated in Aotearoa are Māori. Therefore, I see it as this, this issue is not only just an issue of justice and humanity, but it's also an issue that I feel obliged to engage with as a result of my responsibilities um, to my treaty partners. So that's, that is why I begin with my pepeha um, and acknowledge Te Tiriti o Waitangi as the covenant and, and my covenant. Um, I also would love to acknowledge my supervisor, Professor Nicole Morham, who I believe is on the webinar tonight. Um, this paper would not have made it to completion without her expert guidance and, and Nicole, your belief in me and my creative ideas. Um, so I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to learn from you in close proximity and I'm grateful you're here tonight. So I will start by giving a brief overview of what we'll cover. Um, I'll begin with a synopsis of the issue of privacy in New Zealand prisons. Um, and specifically what I refer to in my paper as psychiatric segregation units. Um, I'll discuss possible avenues for challenging that issue and then I'll give an overview of the key arguments in my paper and then we'll finish with some question and response time. Um, and as Thomas said, you can yeah feel free to put questions in the, I think there's a Q&A function on the webinar. Um, let's see if this works. Change my slide. Here we go. So it's been famously said that the degree of civilization in a society is revealed by entering its prisons. If this is true, then one might be disappointed by the measure of civilization in our society after reflecting on the state of our prisons in Aotearoa. 
I first encountered some of the horror of our incarceration system in reports released by People Against Prisons Aotearoa. Um, and actually, I want to offer a, a mahi to them for the, the work that they do in this space. I, it's incredible advocacy um, that, yeah, I see is very, very important. Um, it was also the genesis of this paper for me. Specifically, um, their 2016 report on torture in New Zealand prisons. So their report was a compilation of a series of findings from the Office of the Ombudsman. And in it, I encountered the issue of privacy breaches in psychiatric segregation facilities. Um, I was immediately struck by the inhumanity of this practice and wanted to write about how the law could and perhaps should respond. So the status quo. Incarcerated people who are segregated for mental health risk monitoring are housed in specialised units in prisons across the country. Um, these units are commonly known as at-risk units or ARUs or intervention and support units or ISUs. Um, so if you're reading any literature, those might be the terms to look out for in that space. Um, but for the purpose of simplicity, I'll be referring to them as psychiatric segregation facilities. Um, yeah, in the last year, there have been approximately 3,200 people incarcerated in these facilities, which is about 40% of our national prison population for that same period. Um, and the average number of days spent in these facilities is seven days. But that can range up to like a lot more than that, um, up to months and down to just a few days or um, a number of hours. It really depends on the case. Um, psychiatric segregation facilities, um, they exist for the close monitoring of people who have presented with immense mental health difficulties, particularly where there's a risk of self-harm or suicide. Um, accordingly, the facilities are equipped for monitoring and with the, they have the ability for correction staff and other mental health practitioners and people who work in those facilities to supervise and attend to the occupants um, in order to mitigate those mental ill health associated risks. These facilities, however, are under constant CCTV surveillance. Currently, privacy screening is prohibited under Schedule 2 Part C of the Corrections Regulations 2005. Um, and so this means that um, the whole cell, including the hygiene areas where um, the toilets are and the showers are, are in full view of the CCTV cameras at all times. Um, and the footage uh, ca it captures these, these CCTV cameras capture footage of occupants while they're using the toilet, while they're showering, um, or in various stages of undress. So just the whole cell all the time. Um, worst still, in many prisons, that footage is not actually restricted from general view. So you've got your CCTV cameras in the cells, and then the footage at the other end that's being broadcast onto monitors um, the ombudsman, when going and doing a series of um, unannounced inspections, found and reported on cases where that CCTV footage is streamed on monitors which are placed in communal access ways. Um, so this means that prison staff, um, the ones that are interested in, in working in that case, but also other non-interested parties within prison staff, um, other incarcerated people, and sometimes members of the public who are visiting the prison, can all view that footage at any one time um, because these monitors are placed in yeah, communal access ways in public areas. Um, so it's not restricted from view. So in my paper, I framed the issue as twofold. Firstly, occupants of psychiatric segregation facilities are being watched via CCTV while they're undertaking private ablutions. And then also the extent to which the footage is viewable is unjustified. So those were the kind of the two things that I was um, working with in, in my paper. Um, tonight, I'll discuss the harm that arises from these issues and then I'll give a legal analysis. Um, so here we go. In my research, I found that there is cause to believe that there's a relationship between privacy and well-being. Studies done on the impacts of surveillance indicated that well-being is compromised by surveillance. Um, and there was one particularly interesting study on prison architecture, which found that privacy was an essential component of humanizing prison environments. So the presence of a privacy screen to conceal toilet and shower areas of a cell made a massive difference um, and increased the sense of privacy that the occupants felt, which in turn, the research showed, lowers levels of stress hormones and increases um, the occupant's perception of environmental control. So um, 
the, they actually found that the, the layout of the architecture made a really big difference to the well-being of the people incarcerated there and specifically privacy was identified as a factor um, that was important in, in lowering stress and yeah, um, increasing well-being. In another um, also very interesting study done on women on parole who were subject to surveillance conditions, it was found there that levels of stress, anxiety and powerlessness were increased by surveillance. Um, and in a study of inpatient of an inpatient psychiatric hospital, it was also found that um, surveillance was injurious to long-term mental health and created perverse outcomes, actually. So there were negative emotions and mental illnesses um, that were exacerbated, in turn, leading to greater risks of violence and self-harm. So that perverse outcome of um, there being an outcome that was not the, um, the design of the surveillance in the first place, which was put in place for monitoring um, those very risks. I think um, all of us here tonight could probably agree that being watched while you're using the toilet, showering or undressing is a clear and gross invasion of privacy um, and an affront to one's own dignity. I think this argument is strength strengthened by the existence of the tort of intrusion into seclusion, which I'll come to shortly. Um, with it, so with this tort, there's an abundance of overseas precedent that watching other people in these private moments is actionable in law. In New Zealand, um, the claimant in the leading case of intrusion into seclusion, which I'll also come to shortly, is known to have suffered ongoing distress and mental health issues after that intrusion. So the harm is really clear um, when people are intruded on in these really private moments. There are um, repercussions in mental health and exacerbating um, previous issues, but also creating um, new issues um, around well-being and mental health, um, which is obviously at odds with um, at odds with wanting to monitor people for those very risks. So having established that, there are a few legal avenues by which these issues can be addressed. Um, I put Privacy Act question mark because you might think that the Privacy Act um, is a legal avenue that you could go down here. And I um, thought that at the start of my research and had a look into it. Um, under the Privacy Act 2020, people can lay complaints with the Privacy Commissioner for breaches of privacy, but the Privacy Act deals with the collection, access and publication of informational privacy rather than physical privacy, um, which is a distinction um, that has come up in some of the literature around um, yeah, privacy in regards to informational private facts about oneself um, versus privacy in terms of your physical space and physicality, um, those being two um, distinct kinds of privacy. Um, so yeah, for that reason, the Privacy Act is not the right instrument um, to address the issue here. So I thought I'd just clear that up. Um, then you've got OPCAT. So New Zealand is a signatory to the United Nations Optional Protocol to the Convention Against Torture, OPCAT, and the Crimes Against Torture Act um, of 1989 gave effect to OPCAT in New Zealand. So that act empowers the Ombudsman in Section 27 to carry out inspections of detention facilities. Um, so not just prisons, but all detention facilities. Um, yeah, I won't go into that. That's a, that's a side note. But they, yeah, um, empowers the Ombudsman to carry out inspections of these detention facilities, write reports, and then make recommendations. Um, the Office of the Ombudsman carries out routine um, and random inspections in New Zealand prisons and other detention facilities to assess compliance with OPCAT. Um, I, and in my paper, I actually referred to a lot of um, reports from the Ombudsman um, who had yeah, travelled around these prisons um, across the country and reported on the detention facilities there. So that was a really useful um, resource. But um, the Office of the Ombudsman can only make recommendations. Um, so yeah, that's that's one legal avenue. Um, judicial review proceedings could be could be lodged seeking a declaration of inconsistency or a DOI from the court. Um, this is where the court is asked to assess whether an infringement upon people's protected rights under the Bill of Rights Act is demonstrably justified. And if a senior court decides that such an infringement is not demonstrably justified, they can make a declaration of inconsistency. Um, at the end of the day, Parliament holds the power to amend the law in line with the DOI or simply ignore it. But either way, DOIs are of high public and constitutional significance and they signal to the voting population where a law is incongruent with the Bill of Rights Act. Um, this wasn't the focus of my paper, 
but I actually think a judicial review proceeding would be quite interesting on this issue because I think it's a lesser known issue um, and you might think of like the Make It 16 cases that have been through been through the courts in recent times. Um, that was a way of, I mean, it, it, did a mum, it did a number of things, but one of the functions of, of that judicial review proceeding was um, to bring to public attention, hey, this is, um, the court here is saying that this law is inconsistent with the Bill of Rights um, and therefore, you know, kind of puts it to Parliament, what are you going to do about that um, in the in the public square? So for what it's worth, I think it would be interesting um, having a judicial review proceeding um, in this space. But as my paper argues, I think that there's actually good a good case to be made that this practice can be challenged in the civil jurisdiction under the tort of intrusion into seclusion. Um, so the Ministry of Justice um, kind of articulates torts as common law actions where a person seeks compensation for harm caused by a wrongful act. So tort law sets out the rules for attributing liability for harm and covers things like defamation, negligence, trespass, false imprisonment, assault, and privacy, among other things. Um, in tort law, affected individuals can bring an action in tort seeking compensation for harm done. And in this case, it would be an incarcerated person bringing an action in the tort seeking compensation for the harm done via the CCTV surveillance of private ablutions. So that brings me to the tort of intrusion into seclusion, as I mentioned before, um, and the articulation of the specific harm there that occurs as a result of CCTV practices. In discovering um, that the New Zealand privacy tort, um, which as I said before, focuses um, primarily on informational privacy and publication given to private facts, um, when when faced with the situation in the case of C in Holland, Justice Fata um, int introduced the tort of intrusion into seclusion into New Zealand jurisprudence. Um, that was actually brought over, um, I, as I understand it, from the American jurisdiction um, where there's four different kinds of privacy torts, one of which is this physical privacy intrusion into seclusion. Um, and so when the kind of the privacy tort that we had in existence in New Zealand um, it was sort of a square peg in a round hole. It didn't fit the situation um, in the case of C in Holland. Um, and so the, the tort of intrusion into seclusion was a more appropriate way of addressing that harm. So in that case, in C in Holland, the claimant, C, was filmed unbeknownst to her by her flatmate um, while she was naked and showering. Um, the footage wasn't distributed at all. And she only came across it, I believe, when he, she and her boyfriend um, discovered it just by happenstance on her flatmate's laptop, which they borrowed to watch a film one evening, I think. Um, so found this found this footage of herself on her flatmate's laptop and obviously learned that he'd taken that footage um, and and then took an action um, in privacy against, against the flatmate. Um, the crux of the harm in this case is unlike the normal, well, the, the previous privacy tort because there was no publication, um, which is a requirement of, um, the privacy tort in New Zealand. But here, the harm exists in the fact of the intrusion itself. Um, so no kind of dissemination or publication of that footage was required to make out the, court, uh, the tort. Um, and as you see on the screen, the elements of the tort are an intentional and unauthorised intrusion into seclusion involving the infringement of a reasonable expectation of privacy that is highly offensive to a reasonable person. As I'll explain... I think that the tort is made out on the facts of the surveillance of private ablutions in psychiatric segregation units in New Zealand prisons. Um, the intrusion, that is the, the surveillance, it's intentional, it's legislated. Um, I'll come back to the issue of authorization as this is that, that issue of author, authorization is what the argument ultimately hinges on. Um, so just park that to one side for now. We'll come back to unauthorized um, because you might be thinking quite rightly, well, if it's legal under the corrections regulations, then surely it's an authorised intrusion. To part that and we'll return to that shortly. Um, but dealing with other elements of the tort, the intrusions are clearly into intimate personal activity, toileting, showering, undressing, that all meets these requirements. Um, as I argue in my paper, what will constitute a reasonable expectation of privacy in prison will differ to general society due to the level of oversight that's required to maintain safe custodial management. So I do accept that the, the very nature of a prison environment is going to inhibit privacy in some way. 
Um, however, as it will become clear when I discuss the Bill of Rights implications, I do not accept that all privacy considerations are simply obliterated in, pri in prison. Um, so therefore, a reasonable expectation of privacy with respect to using the toilet and having a shower or undressing, I, I think does endure here. I think that's still a reasonable expectation. And I kind of, in the paper, go into um, a deeper argumentation around that. But for tonight, that will suffice. The, the third element of the tort is met um, here. And then finally, there's no guidance given in the case of CN Holland as to how Justice Futter considered the highly offensive element of the tort and, and how he kind of came to his conclusions around that. Um, but it's worth noting that this element is actually doubted by academics and some judges where a reasonable expectation of privacy exists and then is intruded upon. The bare fact of the intrusion will be highly offensive. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a perfunctory element of the tort. Um, I could get into arguments as to why that should be removed altogether, but that's not the point here. So we'll, we'll press on. But the main thing is that the intrusions into the private ablutions of incarcerated people clearly meets the highly offensive threshold. So all that remains is a discussion of authorization. These intrusions, as I set out at the start, are provided for in law by the Corrections Regulations 2005. But the Bill of Rights Act, um, under the rights of persons arrested or detained, might have something to say about that. Um, before getting into the specific provision that I think applies here, I do need to explain how the Bill of Rights can possibly apply to the corrections regulations, um, as our Bill of Rights in New Zealand is not supreme law, so it can't automatically strike down any, any law or um, secondary legislation that is not um, consistent with the Bill of Rights. That doesn't mean it's an automatic override. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about we'll talk about that now. We'll come to my little diagram um, if it will work for me. Hopefully, hopefully we can follow this little diagram. Um, so if we begin with the Bill of Rights Act on the left hand side, under Section Four of the Bill of Rights, where there's an enactment, so another law that is inconsistent with the provisions that are contained in the Bill of Rights that other law will not be overridden or impliedly repealed by the Bill of Rights, as I was saying before. So at first glance, it seems that the corrections regulations are not bound by the Bill of Rights. However, in tension with Section 4 is Section 6 of the Bill of Rights Act, which sets out that where it's possible to take a Bill of Rights consistent interpretation or give a rights consistent meaning, this meaning is to be preferred. That brings me to the Corrections Act 2004, um, the Corrections Act is what we'd call the primary piece of law or the empowering statute, which gives the Department of Corrections the power to create their own regulations to run the Department of Corrections and the um, subsidiary institutions underneath that. So the empowering provision in the Corrections Act, um, sections, for those interested, sections 200, uh, 200 subsection 1 to 3, and 202B, um, these empowering provisions, they don't explicitly override the Bill of Rights, um, and they're also capable of interpretation consistent with the Bill of Rights. Therefore, the Corrections Act, um, we can take a rights consistent meaning here because the, the language of the statute doesn't exclude that. Um, so the Corrections Act is then subject to the Bill of Rights. Um, case law has established that delegated legislation or secondary legislation which in this case is the corrections regulations, must conform to the empowering provision for the secondary le legislation to be legal. So you've got your um, you've got your primary statute, which is the Corrections Act, and then the secondary legislation, which is the um, the corrections regulations. And case laws established that these regulations must conform to um, the empowering provision in the in the primary legislation. Also, um, any secondary legislation, and this is the this is the key for part of my thesis here, um, any secondary legislation must also conform to any limitations that are imposed on the primary legislation. So here, the secondary legislation of the corrections regulations must conform to the Bill of Rights Act because the Bill of Rights Act constrains the primary legislation. So that brings me to the conclusion that the corrections regulations themselves must comply with the Bill of Rights Act. And where they don't comply with the Bill of Rights Act, they'll be ultra virus and, and therefore unlawful. Um, so that's great, we've established that. But the central question that you're probably all itching to know is, does 
Does the Bill of Rights Act actually protect privacy? Because last time I checked, Anna, there was no privacy right in the Bill of Rights. So if you take a brief survey of the Act, the answer, the simple answer is no. However, as my paper argues, um, section 23.5 or subsection 5 of the Bill of Rights does actually protect interests in privacy. So again, this is a key part of my thesis here. Um, Legal scholarship has articulated that the common interest underlying all privacy law action, uh, sorry, all privacy actions in law is dignity. Edward Bluestein articulates this as the protection of one's inviolate personality is at the heart of the right to privacy. Um, and in surveying North American legal scholarship on privacy, Bluestein concludes that the thread tying together the various different privacy torts, as I said before, they've got four, unlike New Zealand, which just has the privacy tort and the intrusion tort. So the thread that ties all four of their privacy actions together is dignity. That's the common interest that underpins all actions in privacy. And dignity is protected by the Bill of Rights Act. So my argument is that when you interrogate the underpinnings of the right to privacy, you find that dignity is the interest that lies at the heart of privacy protections. Therefore, where the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act extends protection of the inherent dignity of a person who's deprived of their liberty, as you can see on the screen here under section 23, subsection 5, when the inherent dignity is protected, my argument is that the right to privacy is actually included as a subset within that protection of dignity. So privacy is part, um, yeah, privacy is part of dignity. It's a, it's a factor, a facet of dignity there. Um, and I did do quite a long... Um, a long-winded exposition on that in my paper. So if you want that, you can read the you can read the long version. But for now, that's the um, the gist of that. So even if you agree with me that privacy is protected by the Bill of Rights, um, guarantees in the Bill of Rights are not absolute. State bodies can limit rights and freedoms contained in the Act, um, but they must show that that limitation is demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society under Section Five of the Bill of Rights. So that requires a Section 5 analysis and the methodology um, for a Section 5 analysis is provided by the case of Hansen and R. For the sake of keeping the time in the seminar, I won't take you through the granular detail of my argument there, but suffice it to say that um, the purpose, safe custodial management, so actually I'll backtrack and just say in the in the Corrections Act, um, when it talks about the purpose of the Act, there's a, a number of listed um, stated purposes um, that corrections are supposed to carry out and that their regulations are supposed to comply with, one of which is safe custodial management. And in all of my um, interactions with um, corrections through the OIA process, um, safety and safe custodial management was the justification that was advanced time and time again for these privacy intrusions. Um, but another um, equally weighted imperative and the purpose of the Corrections Act is rehabilitation and reintegration of offenders. Um, and so there's that that rehabilitation aspect is something that is in tension potentially in this space with safe custodial management because of the harms that arise from some of the practices that are um, being employed to carry out safe custodial management. We kind of had this toing and froing and um, yeah, there's, there's tension there, which the Section 5 um, analysis in my paper does kind of delve into in a deep way. Um, but for now, the purpose, um, I would I would agree that the purpose is absolutely sufficiently important to justify some curtailment of the right to privacy. Carrying out safe custodial management is of paramount importance when you've got people's lives in really, really vulnerable positions. Um, yeah, that, that safety imperative is a sufficiently important purpose that does justify the curtailment of those Section 23, Subsection 5 rights. Um, the limiting measure, so the preventing of privacy screening and the implementation of CCTV under the corrections regulation, that limiting measure is rationally connected with the purpose of monitoring occupants for their safety, so that makes sense. Um, I think where the Section 5 analysis falls over is at the third step. Um, I think this is an impairment of the right, which is far more than reasonably necessary. So in the paper, I talk about um, a couple of examples, one being the Auckland South Correctional Facilities. Um, so Auckland South Correctional Facilities are a private prison. They're, to my knowledge, the, the country's only private prison. And because they're private, they're not subject to the corrections regulations, which means um, 
schedule two part C where it, where it rules out privacy screening and says no nope, you can't you can't have privacy screening in cells and there must be CCTV surveillance those regulations are not imposed on um, Auckland South Correctional Facilities and in a report from the Ombudsman um, Peter Boschia actually um, praised um, Auckland South Correctional Facilities for having privacy screening in place um, so they have they they can do it the way they want and they have privacy screening around the hygiene areas of the cell um, to prevent occupants being in view of the CCTV while they're undertaking their private ablutions. Um, IA Arson and OIA has this impeded like to to Auckland South has this impeded impeded your ability to um, carry out safe custodial management. Has it contributed to any increased risk of self harm or suicide? Um, what are, what's kind of been the fallout of this? privacy screening being implemented and installed um, and the response was that it has in no way um, inhibited that um, and, and in fact um, they were they were able to carry out their safe custodial management and kind of protect the the dignity of the occupants in that in that space um, one of the things that they did say was that just and now we're getting into kind of nitty-gritty cell design things but um, there's a, a way that they can be viewed by um, people who are monitoring them, those so specific people who are involved in that person's case and and looking after them, they are able to view them through I think like a, a slot or a, a, some kind of viewing um, thing in the door of the cell. Um, all of the cells viewable through that, but the the privacy screening protects the hygiene areas from view of the CCTV, so it's not kind of being broadcasted into like I was saying before, those monitors that are in public access ways. So that's an example that I think illustrates that the current practice in our in the rest of our prisons in Aotearoa who are subject to the regulations, that is an impairment of the right that is more than is reasonably um, necessary. Also, pixelation software is being trialled at the moment. Um, I'm not actually sure where that's at at the moment. I tried to have a look at that today um, to see if there'd been any updates on that and I couldn't find anything. But there was a national working group established to trial pixelation software that pixelated um, the CCTV around the hygiene areas of the cell. Um, I have other thoughts about that approach, but I think, it, yeah, for what it's worth, it indicates that there are definitely other ways to achieve the purpose of safe custodial management um, without just completely obliterating one's right to privacy. I think on the final point um, of proportionality, um, in the Hansen uh, analysis, safety is absolutely an important objective. But in this case, I would argue that the limitation on the right to privacy here is so intense that it actually undermines the safety objective. So as discussed earlier, the impacts of surveillance can actually, they can be these negative mental health outcomes. Um, and those mental health outcomes can be exacerbated or even created by surveillance. So that's a perverse outcome. We are trying to achieve safe custodial management. People are in these um, psychiatric segregation units ostensibly to care for their psychiatric health and mitigate any risks associated with their psychiatric health and state of, of ill health, perhaps. Um, but the, the very conditions of those units are such that those issues will be well, are likely to be exacerbated. Um, and then with regard to the fact that the footage is not restricted in terms of viewability, um, again, how it's um, yeah portrayed in, on the monitors in public, um, sorry, sort of general communal access ways, the safety rationale wears pretty thin at that point for me. It just seems to be sloppy practice and, yeah, kind of a, um, a disregard for the privacy interests of the people who are incarcerated in those facilities. Um, yeah, there's a more detailed analysis of that in my paper, but that's kind of an overview of why I think that the limitation on the right to privacy um, under Section 23, Subsection 5 of the Bill of Rights is not, that limitation is not demonstrably justified. Which brings me to the culmination of the paper. I think that the tort of intrusion into seclusion can be made out in this case. So the harm suffered by people who are being watched by CCTV monitoring while using the toilet, showering or undressing is egregious. And these types of intrusions have negative impacts as we've discussed. Um, and interestingly, those impacts can actually be, not only can they be severe, but they can be long lasting. So really thwarting that, um, that 
statutory purpose of rehabilitation and reintegration um, under the Corrections Act. Uh, the sloppy surveillance practices and the lack of privacy screening in these units means that the occupants are constantly subject to gross privacy intrusions. And the harm there, as we've talked about, is the same harm which we've condemned as a society in the tort of intrusion and seclusion. So private individuals in um, free society can sue one another for those kinds of intrusions. And I see no reason in logic why the state should not also be liable and tort for these intrusions, which when you consider the Bill of Rights Act are unauthorized. Um, in closing, I'll say that I do accept that there's going to be some conflict between the right to privacy and the imperative of safe custodial management. But that doesn't mean that these objectives are irreconcilable. Um, in the incarceration context, the state is wielding some of its most significant co coercive power. And in my opinion, it's a matter of justice and, and actually institutional legitimacy that those powers and particularly coercive powers are used in the most minimal and justified way. So I'll finish with a quote from Bluestein, which I opened my paper with that I think gets to the heart of this. A democratic state which values individual liberty can no more tolerate an intrusion on privacy by a private person than by an officer of government and the protections afforded in tort law, like those afforded under the constitution or the Bill of Rights Act, if we're in New Zealand, are designed to protect the same value. Nor reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Anna. Um, that was a, for summarising what was quite a long paper in a quite an efficient and effective manner. Thank um, you. Yeah, I'm afraid, unfortunately, we can't have the problem with our webinars. We can't have um, we can't have applause, but uh, I'll, I'll sort of offer you up some virtual applause anyway. All as well. <laughs> now, I do have some questions. I'm going to start off with one of my own questions, which I guess sure. is interesting to me. Is it? Um, why did you choose to write about this topic in in particular? Yeah, um, it's a good question. So when I was looking for a topic, oh, actually, I'll, I'll backtrack. I'll start with um, this paper was written as an honours paper for my first year of honours. So um, at Te Heringa Waka at Victoria, um, in your first year of honours, you are invited to write what's called the Laws 489, which is um, a self-directed research project um, at 400 level. And you get um, matched up with a supervisor who, whose expertise is in the field that you're wanting to write in. And you kind of like... It was quite amazing. I, I felt like I had free reign to sort of um, find a topic that I was really interested in. So when I was looking for a topic, I wanted it to be three things. Um, I wanted it to be within the field of a supervisor I knew I could work well with. Kia ora to Nicole, who I worked well with, I think. <laughs> um, so that was great. Um, I wanted it to be a topic that interested me or kind of moved me in a way such that I was motivated to research and write about it for months on end um, and I also wanted it to be a topic that needed to be written about so I wasn't interested in contributing academic noise and wanted to write on something that really needed attention um, and I guess it kind of goes without saying once you read my paper but I'm I'm personally quite appalled by the prison system in Aotearoa and the way that we treat incarcerated people so anything that I can do with my legal skills to encourage more humanity in that space um is a space yeah it's, it's something that i'm interested in, in doing in that space so yeah i've got a question which is a combination of mine one of my audience members is that you suggest that incarcerated people might uh, have been watched in this manner might want to sue the department of corrections using the tort of intrusion into seclusion um what would that practically what would that involve and and, and do you do you think it would have any chance of success thank you for the question um yeah so this is an interesting question um i'll speak first to the kind of practicalities and then my thoughts on that so the practicalities it would involve a person who has been subjected to this harm so an incarcerated or formerly incarcerated person who'd experienced that cctv surveillance while undertaking ablutions um which would likely happen in one of those psychiatric segregation units um they would need to get a lawyer to bring a case in the tort of intrusion into seclusion, suing the Department of Corrections as a defendant. And that would involve establishing the requirements for the tort of intrusion, as I've done in my paper. Um, and there'd be other evidential requirements and procedural requirements, but that's kind of the gist there. Um, as for the chance of success, 
I think that's that's pure speculation at one level because I have no idea how a court would treat this. Um, I think it would be likely that the Department of Corrections would want to settle these grievances privately to avoid bringing the institution into public disrepute. Um, yeah, there was some discussion under the last government about changes to the corrections regulations and a couple of cabinet papers actually mentioned the privacy screening issue, but it was unclear like how that was going to be changed and if that was going to be implemented. Um, and I had, again, I had a look today actually at the progress of the corrections regulations amendment bill. And it seems that the um, the discussions around the privacy issues um, had just been scrapped. And that's not a part of the current corrections regulations amendment bill, which is being taken forward by um, the coalition government. Um, yeah. So, and I, I think the select committee is due to report back at the end of May on that. Um, so it'll be interesting if, yeah, it'd be interesting if the privacy issue comes through in those reports or if that um, remains dropped as it appears to be in the current draft of the bill. Um, yeah, so I don't know as for success. I'd, I'd hope so, but... It seems knows. like a bit of a problem that nothing will be done unless someone brings a court action because we can't really rely on the Arthur Taylors of this world to sort of make change, can we? Yeah. <laughs> I think um, Arthur Taylor's a bit of a, a legend in that space um, and has done a lot of work to champion the rights of incarcerated people um, and I think helpfully challenge our society actually on the way we think about um, people who are incarcerated. I don't necessarily think it's the case that nothing will be done unless court proceedings go ahead. Um, just thinking of advocacy groups in particular like Just Speak and um, People Against Prisons on Seattle and other advocacy organisations. I think there is some lobbying in that space which is really positive but yeah I, I do I would agree that because our incarcerated population are possibly the most marginalised group in society, it's pretty concerning to me that for practices within prisons to change, and if an incarcerated person themselves has to take that action in court proceedings, um, that's it's pretty abysmal, really, because we know that those court proceedings exhaust financial and emotional and other kinds of resources and is full of delay and compromise and... Mm -hmm. And not everyone in prison simply is an Arthur Taylor, unfortunately. That's <laughs> that um, he's a particular kind of character. Um, yeah. yeah. Yep. Changing topic a little bit. Um, do you know how long they keep the CCTV footage for? And um, and if they assuming they keep it for quite a while, does that does that amplify the harm of the intrusion? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question, actually. And when I was looking into the Privacy Act and whether it would be applicable at all that came to mind of like, oh, that that would be, that would fall under informational privacy protection um, and issues of informational privacy breaches. Um, I don't know, because it was, it was actually a bit beyond the scope of what I was writing about um, in terms of the what happens to the footage itself, because I was mainly focusing on that, the harm done by the intrusion itself. But I think you could probably write an equally long or longer paper on how that kind of footage is dealt with and um yeah i think that problems would definitely arise or the harm is definitely compounded upon um if that footage is sort of kept forever or handled quite badly or you know with with low security around it um yeah i'd be interested to find out and speaking of that footage i mean i was quite disturbed to hear that this footage is actually being shared sort of around the prison and it can be accessible in public access ways or in just in the general control rooms and so on. that seems like a real sort of um exacerbation of the problem i guess um if there was better control of the footage would this reduce the amount of intrusion and, and maybe even tip the balance so it wouldn't actually get to this um this level of actually you know of making the tort work i guess mm. I think in some ways they're two separate issues. So the the fact alone of being watched in such a vulnerable state is on its own an affront to dignity. So take C in Holland, the climate was filmed, but the footage wasn't distributed or published at all, but the harm was still there and the harm was still actionable. So I do think there's, a, I think there's still an issue in the fact of the intrusion on its own. However, I would probably say that, yeah, the extent of the viewability of the footage would, I think it would go to the proportionality analysis under the Bill of Rights considerations. So if the broadcasting, well, broadcasting is not really, I'm kind of reaching for a word in here because broadcasting feels wrong, but sort of if the broadcasting of the footage was more restricted, say to only staff members that had an interest in that particular case, 
um, and mental health practitioners who were involved in, in um, caring for these people. Um, then I think it would have a better chance. I think that like the procedure and the practice would have a better chance of being demonstrably justified um, and, and that, that limitation being demonstrably justified on the right to privacy. But um, I, I, I do still think there's, um, you could probably separate the two things out actually and have um, have an action about the intrusion on its own and then some, something else around the, um, the extent of the viewability, yeah. I was looking at my questions online. So I've got a slightly more political question, which, which you may or may not want to essay an answer to. Sure. <laughs> um, someone is wondering what extent does corrections practice in denying prisons privacy and dignity reflect the, the beliefs of the policymakers and staff that prisoners don't really deserve human or civil rights? You know, they're not quite proper people. Um, do you have any thoughts on that and what would be needed to change those attitudes? Mm. Uh, I'll be careful about how I answer this one, but I, <laughs> so as not to make any undue criticism, um, but I, I would say that my observation, actually, I'll, I'll speak from my own experience. When I was writing this paper and when I was talking to family members, people in my community, people at university um, about what I was writing the paper about, I, I was bouncing the idea off a few people and kind of seeing what people's responses were. And I was actually quite shocked that um, I often found myself in conversations with people who just simply couldn't believe that I was going to write a paper such as this because, and, and the line that was peddled out again and again was, oh, well, people give up their rights when they go to prison. That's just part of the deal. Um, and those conversations highlighted to me how our cultural attitude and, and, you know, it's another thing to kind of talk about an institutional occupational culture within corrections. I would, I'm, I'd, I'd signal that I do think there are issues there. Um, but even generally in our cultural attitude in Aotearoa, um, it's pretty abysmal in terms of how we think about incarcerated people. And it lacks, it actually really lacks humanity. I think that for political will and to increase, to address these types of issues um, in the first place, there needs to be some fundamental change to the way our society perceives incarceration and the people who are caught up in that, in that institution. Um, and I don't actually, I don't think that many people, um, and I'm not actually necessarily, I'm not necessarily saying I'm one of them, but I, don't, I generally think that people in society in Aotearoa don't understand the realities of those institutions unless they've encountered them personally um, or even academically or professionally. You get a bit more of a sense for what those institutions are like. But largely, I think people just don't, don't realise um, the reality there so that's probably a bit of a roundabout answer but I, I would say that occupational culture definitely is a plays a role here um, and I haven't done the research into that to really speak to that with with precision but um, I do think it is an issue yeah I'll take the opportunity to mention we've been we're one of the sponsors along with Amnesty and others of uh, Aotearoa Justice Watch which is designed to let people who have been treated badly in prisons or by the police just have a chance to tell someone about it and have that have that information shared so we can actually use that to help raise people's awareness of these issues um so yeah okay mm -hmm. next question i've got is that uh have you sent a copy of your part paper to the department of corrections and the ombudsman and uh, if so have they made any have you had any response um i do have a um contact at the ombuds the office of the ombudsman who asked me to send them the paper to send on to the ombudsman so I did that um, and I haven't had any comments in response yet um, mm -hmm. and I haven't sent it to the Department of Corrections I'm seeking publication of the paper in a New Zealand law journal and I'm hoping that that will kind of get the word out a little bit and, and maybe it will find its way to the desk of the law commission or the Department of Corrections we'll see but it's a good idea <laughs> it's got a couple more questions I think um, a compliment outstanding stuff um, and this is another more wider political question. Do you think uh, adding a direct right to privacy, being added to the Bill of Rights would help situations like, like this or, or to be surplus to the human dignity right? It's an interesting question. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I think, what do I think about that? I think that, well, there's two things. One, I think adding the right to privacy into our Bill of Rights Act um, would be an interesting step forward given that we have 
a privacy tort in the country and we could you could kind of go down the avenue of developing the privacy tort and adopting something a bit more similar to um, the North American um, privacy torts where there's four that cover those um, four different situations which all kind of are captured within the notion of privacy protection so if you were to then introduce so we could either go down that, that avenue as a country or um, you could introduce a, an express right to privacy within the Bill of Rights Act. Um, I think, yeah, that, that could be a good idea. I, I think you'd want to think through that well about how it interacts with the other rights within the Act as well and because there's always going to be tensions that arise there. But I actually think that there's an opportunity potentially in this space and in other situations to develop the case law around the interpretation of Section 20 three subsection five um, and if we can actually like say say incarcerated people started bringing these kinds of cases um actions in um, the tort of intrusion before the courts and the courts were interpreting um interpreting the unauthorized limb the same way that i've done here and that would actually like develop some jurisprudence around that interpretation to say oh when we talk about being treated with dignity privacy is a um is a subsidiary component of dignity and therefore privacy is protected. So you could you could do it in a, in a lot of different ways, but I wonder if that's um, that could be an interesting avenue to go down, um, you know, strengthening that link between dignity and privacy. I think that would be a helpful, um, a helpful link to strengthen anyway, because um, well, I, again, in talking to a lot of people about this paper, um, the, the link isn't actually a logical step necessarily for a lot of people. Um, or, or have like haven't thought about that connection. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but that's those are my thoughts. Thank you for the question, Thomas. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, we've got a, if a group of incarcerated people were able to bring a successful action on this tour on the basis that you've argued, what sort of remedies will be available for the plaintiffs? Um, and um, follow-up question: of, Would any remedies in private law be likely to contribute to broader changes in prisons? If this, you know, if, 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 if there was successful action. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, there are a range of remedies that would be available, but I guess um, so. Yeah, compensation being maybe the number one thing, get being um, compensated for the harm um, under con com compensatory damages. Um, but I think the angle that I take in my paper and what I would kind of hark back to here is that individual compensation to people is is helpful and it's it's good for those individuals who bring the cases but in terms of law change that's not really the point right like i hear in the question the um the concern that well compensating one to ten incarcerated people for this issue isn't going to necessarily create a shift in the law but i think um like you see with some of the um the arthur taylor cases and some of the other the other cases around um the way people have been have experienced treatment in prison um it's actually of a symbolic significance so there's that individual case with the individual person against the department of corrections or a specific person in um, within that institution and between them it gets resolved through that process and gets this compensation allocated but i think at a greater level the sim the symbolic um nature of that of okay, the practice, like the, the legal practices within these prisons are so awry that somebody can take an action in court and be compensated. That in and of itself, I think, speaks um, speaks volumes in terms of institutional change. So I guess you just hope that there would be enough publicity um, around a case like that that people would, would start to kind of think, oh, hang on, well, if the Department of Corrections is being sued for something that is ostensibly lawful, um, on its face, then what's what's you know what do we need to change here? So, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we might finish up there. I think the other questions we've had have sort of been uh, covered already in your material. I think. Um, so uh, thanks again for making the uh, you know taking the time to present to us and answer all these uh, questions. Some of which were probably a little bit harder than others. Um, now we'll be uh, circulating the slides in the video. That's okay, the slides, that's okay, the video anyway. And on behalf of the New Zealand Council for Civil Liberty, I'd like to thank everyone for um, coming and listening. Um, and obviously, we'd like to invite you, if you're not members already, we'd like to invite you to join, <laughs> which you'll be able to find the joining details on our website. Um,